This is CBS 4 News. Right now at 5, today is the day voters have their say. My opinion matters. That's what I fought for. But we need to know what we're voting for. Lining up to cast their ballots in critical contests that will determine our next governor. Hey, I feel good. It's time to win. Thanks for, you. Thanks for your help. Appreciate you. Thank you. And representatives in Washington, D.C. Tonight, CBS 4 News live team coverage of Election Day. A live picture now from Doral, a polling site where we've seen a steady stream of voters coming in and out all day long. Don't forget, you have until 7 o'clock tonight to get in line and cast your ballot. And it's not just for Floridians who will be watching the results of tonight's races very closely. People around the country will be paying attention to what we decide about who should represent us as our governor, our senator, and our members of Congress. The candidates are fanned out across the state, and so are our reporters covering the candidates and how voting is going here at home. We begin in Orlando tonight with CBS 4's Carrie Codd and the Ron DeSantis campaign. Carrie. Ruta Bay, Elliot, I talked a little while ago with a spokesperson for the DeSantis campaign. They told me that he voted this morning near Jacksonville, then came here to the Rosen Center Hotel in Orlando to relax, unwind, spend some quality time with his family. He'll be watching the results come in here at the hotel, and right now final preparations are being made inside the ballroom just behind the doors here for this event, the campaign event. The doors will open here at 6 o'clock. And today we went out and spoke to several voters here in Orlando as well as a political expert here in Florida to get a sense of how this race might be decided. Ron DeSantis arrived at his polling place near Jacksonville on Election Day to some applause and support from the crowd. Thank you. Appreciate it. Then he and his wife waited in line to cast their votes. DeSantis will watch the returns Tuesday night in Orlando. At polling places across Orlando, turnout appeared steady on Election Day. At Central Parkway Baptist Church, the line stretched out the door. And voters we spoke with, like the candidates for governor, DeSantis and Democrat Andrew Gillum, hold very different views. I voted for uh, the Republican for governor. Keep taxes where they are. Okay, and I think... Uh, his opponent wants to raise taxes. I'm going to be voting for Andrew Gillum. He wants better pay for the teachers. He wants to increase gun control. I'm for that. Election experts like Broward College political science professor Kevin Walsh says the key to a possible DeSantis victory might be unusually high turnout for Republicans in a midterm where their party controls the White House. The Republicans are seem to be uh, more enthusiastic, more energetic than you typically see in these midterm elections. And I think it could be decisive uh, for DeSantis. And no matter who captures the governor's mansion, some voters hope the real winner on Tuesday is compromise. Now we can make uh, compromises and come together and fix what's wrong with our country. I mean, we all identify the same issues. We just have different solutions. Other political analysts I've spoken with today who study Florida politics say the youth vote obviously will be one to watch, how minorities vote, how suburban college-educated women vote. Also another big group, independents in the state of Florida who make up about 27 percent of the electorate. So lots to watch for tonight. Now DeSantis is running against Democrat Andrew Gillum in this race. We want to send it to my colleague Ted Scouten who is in Tallahassee covering Andrew Gillum. Ted. Hi, Carrie. Well, here at Florida A&M University, Andrew Gillum is hoping that this is going to turn out to be a victory party here. He's getting everything set up behind us. Uh, right over there, you can see that's where uh, they're trying to get the whole stage and everything uh, ready for him this evening. One thing he's going to have to deal with, though, uh, potentially is rain. We've been having that throughout the day here in Tallahassee. Now, earlier today, he did go out to vote, and he urged those who did not vote early to get to the polls. Great. How do you like your chances Feels today? Great. I feel good. Democratic gubernatorial nominee Andrew Gillum finally casting his vote after a very long, nasty campaign. Supporters cheering him on. I'm uh, extremely excited to uh, have just, uh, uh, I guess I can reveal, cast a vote for myself. Uh, uh, Make some noise if you going to hit them polls tomorrow and vote for Andrew Gillum. With Sean Diddy Combs and other big stars by his side, Gillum campaigned until the very end with a huge rallying concert that went until the early morning hours at FAMU, trying to get every vote he can. If we show up and we vote, 
The next time I see you, I will greet you as the governor of the great state of Florida. Let's bring it home, everybody. His message resonating with his base. I love his position on the environment. If we don't save Florida, uh, everything else is a moot point. And I really appreciate his position on health care. Gillum is feeling confident going into election night. He has a message for those who did not vote for him. And I'm looking forward to then turning around and going back to those voters who, whose votes uh, I didn't get and letting them know that I plan to be a governor for them too. And that's the thing that Gillum has been doing for the last few days. He has been going around the state telling people, uh, kind of giving his closing argument, saying that if he's elected, he'll be the governor for all. Live in Tallahassee, Ted Scout, CBS 4 News. Thank you, Ted. And now that you've heard from the men who want to be governor, we want to take you to the polls. Yeah, they've been busy in Miami-Dade and Broward counties. We have team coverage of how things are going, beginning with CBS 4's Lisa Petrillo, live in Doral. Hi, Lisa. Hi guys, we're here at Miami-Dade Fire Rescue 69 here in, in Doral. We're about 700 people, they're telling me, have been coming in and out all day. Crowds are now coming back as it's getting a little later in the afternoon. We were way down south in Country Rock, Coral Gables and all over. So far, smooth sailing as Miami-Dade voters come out to the ballots. Voters all over Miami-Dade County doing their part to make their voices count. Everybody needs to vote. That's your, not only your right, but is expected for you as a citizen. Aside from the highly charged governor and senator races, plus local races, voters were dealing with 12 Florida constitutional amendments. So reviewing your ballot for the very first time in the voting booth is not a good idea. Voter preparedness is really important in this election, both from a voter education standpoint, but also, also to expedite your experience at the poll. Here at FIU South Campus, Next Gen America was here to bus students from the school to the precincts and back. Next Gen America is the largest youth vote mobilization campaign in the country, and our goal is to get 18 to 35 year olds registered to vote and now actually out to the polls to vote. Those who voted today were excited. A lot of attention being drawn from people of my generation this year for, to vote, which is really awesome. Yeah. A lot of the time I feel like it's the older people and it's actually these policies and these people are going to affect us just as much. It's an opportunity for me to just go ahead and participate in our community and I feel really good about it. Over at the University of Miami, it was much the same feeling. All the rallies leading up to this was a very good and got the word out and let people know hey if you don't vote you can't really say much and they emphasize it a lot like the at our school everyone's like go out and vote and they do a really good job of getting people out here to vote All right. it is important nice to see the young people coming out to vote especially in these midterm elections license if you have not come out remember you need a photo id or your license it will close here and all the polls at 7 p.m as a matter of fact they told me there's going to be a person right here and the cutoff is seven if you're in line before seven you do get in back to you we'll see you a little later on lisa thanks a lot our team coverage moves now to cbs 4's dave warren he is live tonight in fort lauderdale with what's happening there hi dave Yes, hello, and a lot of people coming in today have seen uh, the high turnout with the early voting. They've seen that and they want to come out today, whether they wait till Election Day or just forgot or tried to vote yesterday. One thing is for sure here at Coral Ridge Mall, uh, there's been a steady line going in and out. I've peeked in a few times and there's been a wait, but uh, the line hasn't really gone out the door. So things overall in Broward County have been moving smoothly. Take a look. After record early voting, the time has come for those who waited to do so. Seeing lines in a midterm election is, I mean, I can't even describe the feeling. Here at Coral Ridge Mall, that feeling was hardly impatient. There were just a few waiting for the polls to open, and once inside, everything seemed to move smoothest, provided you were at the right place. Long precinct. That same can't be said for a location in Deerfield Beach. A polling location was located inside a gated community. The problem? Other precincts that vote there were outside of that. I have totally addressed this many, many times since the primaries when I was the clerk here in August, and nobody's done anything about it yet. Everybody's got a show ID? Yes, sir. To enter, an independent security company asked for ID. A few declined and were delayed, but eventually allowed to vote. But that delay backed traffic up all the way out to the main road. Now, according to Brenda Snipes, nobody was prevented from voting at that location. Overall, it seemed that things were running smoothly for those that waited until Election Day to vote. Exercising their right to have a voice. And for a few today, that reminds them of the sacrifices made for that right. I lost a lot of friends over there. <laughs> if you don't vote, 
What's it all about? Yeah, a lot of range of emotions here as people walked out of the door. And I want to say that part of this story was reported in conjunction uh, with ProPublica's election project. They monitor voting problems there across the country. Overall, the things have been looking pretty good here uh, in Broward County. We're live at the Coral Ridge Mall, waiting for that after work crowd to kind of work their way into the area. We'll keep an eye out. Powerful words from that veteran, Dave Warren. Thank you very much for that update from Fort Lauderdale. And while today is Election Day, new early voting numbers are being reported by the State Elections Department. The number goes up because vote by mail ballots are still coming in. 5.2 million Floridians cast a vote either in person or by mail. More than a million of those voters cast their votes in Miami Dade, Broward, and Monroe counties. Now, there are some things you need to know if you have not cast your vote yet. Remember, you must vote at your designated polling site today. And as long as you are in line at 7 o'clock, you will be allowed to vote. If you have an absentee ballot, you need to either drop it off at elections headquarters or have it canceled at a polling place in order to cast a regular ballot. For more on what you need to know before you vote, go to our website, cbsmiami.com slash election guide. Our coverage of Election Day 2018 doesn't end here. Still to come, a look at the other races being watched closely around the country. And where is President Donald Trump today? That's in our next half hour. I'm David Sutta in Naples with the Scott campaign. It has been the most expensive midterm campaign in the history of not just Florida, but the country. Will it be enough? The story is straight ahead in a live report from Naples. I'm Joan Murray in Orlando with the Democratic Florida Senator Bill Nelson camp. Can he bring it home? I'll have that story straight ahead. Craig Setzer in CBS4 Weather Control. Pretty nice day today, a little bit on the warm side. We have had a few showers, but mostly over the western parts of South Florida. They're looking pretty good here in the metro areas. But good luck at your forecast coming up.
Now back to our coverage of campaign 2018 and our focus is turning now to the Senate showdown. Incumbent Senator Bill Nelson is taking on Republican Governor Rick Scott in one of the most closely watched races in the country. CBS 4's David Sutta kicks off our team coverage with the Scott campaign. He's live tonight in Naples. David. Yeah, I think this is one of those races we're not really sure what's going to happen tonight. Not only are the polls showing it's close, but it's also just history with uh, the governor that shows that his races are typically very close. We're at La Playa Hotel here in Vanderbilt Beach, which is just about North Naples. This is where Rick Scott's campaign will be watching tonight, and at some point he'll be taking that podium behind me, hopefully in his terms, uh, to announce that he's going to be moving from Tallahassee to Washington, D.C. He's had a busy day moving around the state of Florida about 930 this morning morning he was seen in Tampa. He didn't have an official calendar uh, from his uh, campaign offices, so this was just uh, sort of catching him as he went around the state, stopping in to thank volunteers. He was in Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, and then headed over now uh, to the Pensacola region. Now, these are areas with large bases of Republicans that need to turn out today for Scott to have a chance in all of this. Now, Scott has a history, as I said earlier, uh, in races here in Florida. He became governor uh, by winning with just 62,000 votes in 2010. When you look back to 2014, the midterms, 6 million votes were cast in that election. He won by just 64,000 votes in that one. So we caught up with him today in Orlando about his chances of taking a seat that has been owned by the Democrats for 17 years. Ultimately, it becomes a clear choice. Um, Bill Nelson, uh, he doesn't want to work. You know, he's been there for 42 years. He can't name anything he's ever done. Everybody knows I want to work. It, you know, he, nobody wants their taxes going up. He's voted for higher taxes over 300 times. Uh, my grandson told me, he called me, he says, Grandpa, I want you to win because you let people keep their money. And, you know, he, Bill Nelson didn't have a plan. Um, I've got a plan, includes term limits. Because, and, and Bill Nelson needs to be term limited. He's not, he's not doing anything for us. And this is one of the most expensive campaigns that we've had in all of this. This is one of those things that we've been widely reporting because the campaign finance reports are starting to come in. 180 plus million dollars spent here in Florida. 60 million plus coming out of uh, Scott's pocket himself, forking over that money. That, along with the president's support, has made this a real challenge for the Democratic opponent in this, the incumbent, Bill Nelson. With more on that side of things, uh, my colleague Joan Murray is live in Orlando tonight with the Bill Nelson camp. Joan, how are things going there? Good, and the stage is set here at the Embassy Suites in Orlando, David. Uh, the senator is not here. We're told he is at home with friends and will not be coming here until all the votes are counted. It could be a long night considering we have to at least wait until the panhandle central time votes come in. But yesterday when uh, we spoke to him, he said he was confident he was going to pull it off tonight. Election day in Orlando, and it's steady at the polls. Democratic Florida Senator Bill Nelson, who voted early, made no campaign appearances as he defends his seat against sitting Governor Rick Scott. Education, health care, the environment, you know what's at stake. Up until today, Nelson has been crisscrossing Florida, making stops at big Democratic events, promoting his record, his Florida roots, and trustworthiness. Last week, he was in Miami, where President Obama was stumping for Democrats. I feel like in Florida, it's definitely made a lot of environmental stuff. Donald Gianta, a Democrat and millennial, said the election is hot on social media. It's gone away from the what I'm going to do and what I'm going to own and what I hope to accomplish to what they've done or their track record or I think there's too much emphasis on the past and not enough on what I'm doing now and what it can do. For other voters, this Senate race is about deciding which candidate may have an impact on their daily lives. Well, I'm looking for something that actually affect me directly. Anything having to do with the health insurance, um, like about the cost of living in Orlando area, Central Florida, if it's going to affect me and that sort of thing. And we may know soon in this contentious Senate race that's been too close to call. And this is, of course, seen as a must win for the Democratic Party. If they hope to gain control of the Senate and the future of legislation and many other important items in Washington. We'll keep you posted all evening. Reporting live in Orlando, Joan Murray, CBS 4 News.
Joan, thank you very much. David Beckham and Jorge Moss greeted Miami residents today as voters decided whether to approve a soccer stadium deal. A vote on Miami Freedom Park would allow Beckham's MLS soccer group to lease city-owned land for a new soccer stadium. Some residents are concerned about protecting Melrose Golf Course and the elimination of green space and potential traffic problems. Supporters say the park provides more than enough green space, which would be free to everyone, unlike golf. Parkland students and March for Our Lives set up phone banks drives as a final push to get people out to vote today. Students and supporters are calling over 10,000 voters in hopes of increasing the turnout. Among those present, shooting survivors who say this election is more important than ever. This is the start of a marathon that we've been training for for the past eight months since the shooting at our school. And this is a testament to see whether or not people are willing to put their thoughts and prayers in the ballot box. Students say they hope the outreach encourages young people to use their voices and realize the impact they have on Election Day. Now, CBS4 weather with Chief Meteorologist Craig Setzer. Weather-wise, warm and humid as expected. Just a few little sprinkles across the area. Here's our live picture from uh, downtown Fort Lauderdale looking towards the Atlantic, and it's a pretty nice evening. Some high clouds out there. 84 in Miami, 82 Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, and a warm 87 in Key West. Six on our stick, and it's still making it feel like 91. That summertime humidity is going to last through the weekend and into next week until a cold front probably later next week wipes that humidity out. Here's the radar. Some showers and thunderstorms over mainland Monroe. Also, a few showers down in the middle and especially the lower keys and over the seven mile bridge their upper keys looking pretty good as well as mainland south florida miami dade and broward a sprinkle here or there a little bit later on we'll see a few showers popping up temperatures right now mainly in the low to mid 80s and statewide really no problems except up in the panhandle weather wide everybody else has been warm but we have had some thunderstorms that have been sweeping their way east there which uh, i don't know how that would play in the role of the election but that's where the rain is falling statewide also the rain stretches right up the east coast right into New England. Uh, the rest of the country looking pretty good. Here's our forecast for tonight. It's looking pretty good. Spotty showers though later on warm and humid. A low near 76 tomorrow. Look for warm sun and a few showers a day similar to today, but rain chances go up just a little bit. High near 86 for voters. Winds out of the east at 10. Seas running two feet. Light up on the bays and taking us through the rest of the weekend of the weekend. More of the same. A little better chance for showers tomorrow and Thursday. Also a chance for some showers over the weekend. Back to you. Thank you, Craig. Still to come, we're on top of the other big news of the day, including a deadly wrong way wreck overnight on I-75. What happened after the break? Also, a high school security guard arrested and facing drug charges. Details on the arrest next. And control of Congress is up for grabs tonight with some key races being watched here in Florida. That's in our next half hour.
The all clear has been given after a suspicious package scare in Fort Lauderdale. It was found outside of a post office on Las Olas Boulevard. Several businesses had to be evacuated as a precaution and the bomb squad checked it out and then gave it the all clear. A judge has ordered the man accused of mailing more than a dozen mail bombs to be held without bond. Caesar Sayoc made his first appearance in New York City federal court today. He's facing five federal charges and if he's convicted, he could be spending nearly 50 years in prison. Sayoc who is from South Florida will be back in court next Monday. Now at five, police are investigating a deadly wrong way crash. It happened overnight on I-75 near US-27 in Western Broward County. Florida Highway Patrol says a woman in a Honda Civic was driving the wrong way when she slammed into a pickup truck. 23-year-old Flavia Pinto died at the scene. Two people inside the pickup truck suffered serious injuries. Traffic homicide investigators are on scene continue to collect all the evidence, gather at the scene. It's a, it's a massive scene right now. We have two vehicles that are destroyed. A third vehicle was also involved, but the injuries to the two people in that car were minor. Detectives are investigating whether alcohol was a factor. A high school security guard is behind bars tonight. Police tell us that 43-year-old Jamie Green has been accused of dealing cocaine and marijuana. Police say he works at Felix Varela High School in Miami-Dade. Detectives raided his home and found nearly 30 grams of cocaine, according to police, and nearly 800 grams of marijuana. He's been denied bond and facing numerous drug charges. And now back to our coverage of campaign 2018. Voting in the midterm election now underway across the state. Remember, you have until 7 tonight to cast your vote, and it must be at your designated polling location. Among the races being decided tonight, who will represent South Florida in Congress? The candidates in several key races hit the ground running today, hoping to sway the races their way. The choices made tonight will determine the balance of power in the House of Representatives. We have CBS 4 News live team coverage of the big races, and we begin with CBS 4's Peter Dench and the race to replace retiring Congresswoman Ileana ross Leighton. Peter. Well, Ruta Bay, both candidates are running for office for the first time. Former broadcast journalist Maria Elvira Salazar is stressing her strong ties to this heavily Hispanic community. Meanwhile, Donna Shalala, former U.N. president for eight years, is stressing her knowledge of key issues, including health care and immigration reform. As Donna Shalala casts her ballot at Coral Gables Fire Station 3, she says she'll fight for stronger health care. This administration is making war on pre-existing conditions and on Obamacare. 100,000 people in this district have Obamacare, and uh, they want to keep it. Shalala's impressed by long lines of young voters. That's a good sign for America because, frankly, it's their election. It's their future. Shalala's running against Republican Maria Elvira Salazar to replace Ileana ross Leighton, who is retiring. At Salazar casts her vote at the Jose Marti Park Gymnasium. In Little Havana, she stresses her ties to the community. I know what's going on in the countries of origin. For the Nicaraguans and for the Venezuelans and for the Colombians and for the Haitians and for the Cubans, it's very important for them to have somebody that will represent them in Washington that knows what's going on in their countries of origin. And I am that person, not only because I speak Spanish. That has nothing to do with the language. It has to do with the culture. The 56-year-old Salazar has stressed her knowledge of Latin American affairs and energy in pursuing issues. Shalala, who is 77 with Health and Human Services Secretary under President Bill Clinton for eight years, she says she has a lot of experience working both sides of the aisle. We're live at Coral Gables, Peter Dench, CBS 4 News. Okay, Peter, thanks a lot. Another race to watch is the contest between incumbent Republican Congressman Carlos Corbello and his Democratic challenger, Debbie Mercosell Powell. CBS 4's Hank Tester has more on that race. Republican U.S. Congressman Carlos Corbello at the polls early this election day. He's the incumbent in Florida Congressional District 26. Corbello is a moderate Republican who represents a district that has steadily gone blue in recent years. Corbello was reelected in 2016 by 12 points, but Hillary Clinton won the district by 16 points. For that reason, Democrats looked at Corbello's district as one that's up for grabs, and they've poured millions into the campaign of Debbie Powell in an attempt to unseat Carlos Corbello. The district stretches across Kendall, Westchester, South Miami-Dade, includes all of the Florida Keys. 
20 million dollars has been spent by both sides in this contest most of it on television political ads polls rate the nasty race as a toss-up Carvello says voters are fed up they want people in Washington to work together. They want the politicians to put the nasty partisanship aside and get good things done for this community and for the country. Okay, let's move now to CBS 4's Mike Cunio. He is live with Debbie Mukersell Powell's camp down in Southwest Miami Dade. Mike. Yeah, guys, we're here at where they're supposed to be having a watch party tonight. We spoke to someone from the campaign. They're going to be here around 7, 730. As for the candidate herself, Debbie Mukasel Powell spent the day last minute campaigning. District 26 is about as hotly contested as they come. Newcomer Debbie Mukasel Powell's attempt to knock off two term Congressman Carlos Curbelo has been an expensive one. The two sides, along with outside groups, spending more than $20 million. Money Mukersel Powell knows hasn't fallen on deaf ears. There's definitely a feeling of hope that we can actually get our country and put it back on track. Um, I think that it's very exciting. I get a lot of good energy right now. I hope to get your support today. She's been campaigning to the last minute, today bouncing around from voting site to voting site. Mukersel Powell's been running on gun reform and the environment, but her main point of focus has been on health care and the Affordable Care Act something Curbelo voted against. And when Carlos Curbelo took that vote to threaten to take away health care for more than 100,000 families in this community, I knew I had to step in. This race will be tight. Even though Hillary Clinton won the district in the general by 16 points, Curbelo, who's no stranger to reaching across the aisle, won in 2016 by 12 points. I have full confidence that my community understands what's at stake in this election and that they're going to come out and lift their voices up to bring about change. Now, that $20 million we just mentioned is a record for a Florida congressional race. Happy hour here at Black Point Ocean Grill, 3 to 6, but Powell supporters hoping that party lasts a little bit later than that this evening. Mike Cunio, CBS 4 News. All the candidates are. Mike, thank you for that live update from Southwest Miami Dade. Let's turn our attention now north of Broward County and CBS 4's Ty Russell. Ty is live tonight with more on the fight for Debbie Wasserman Schultz's congressional seat. Ty. Ruta Bay and Elliot, the congresswoman, is not here at the campaign headquarters just yet. She's still out hitting the pavement, trying to get those last minute votes. That's because she is facing two opponents who have tried to unseat her before. Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz is fighting to keep her seat in Florida's 23rd district, which covers portions of Broward and Miami Dade counties. We'll know that if they want someone who will stand up for Medicare and Social Security and their, protect their retirement, making sure they elect Democrats all across the uh, all across the country. She has been outspoken against President Trump, which is why the FBI says pipe bomber suspect Caesar Sayoc used her name on packages and sent them to several critics of the president ahead of the midterms. Her opponent, former Democrat, now independent candidate Tim Canova, hopes he can rack up enough votes to unseat the congresswoman. I've been going around the district uh, to polling place after polling place, and it's been very encouraging. Wherever we go, we have a lot of supporters. A lot of people want change. That's very clear. Canova ran as a Democrat in the primary but lost. He also ran for the seat in 2016. Canova and Wasserman Schultz are also facing Republican Joe Kaufman who has run against the congresswoman three times before. There's way too much uh, standardized testing, uh, way, too, way too little uh, vocational training. Kids need to have a good work ethic, and, uh, and that starts from the ground up. Right now, there are no official polls out for this race, so it's still unclear how it may go. Meanwhile, the congresswoman should be here around 8 o'clock tonight. That's when we will be able to go inside. But for now, we are in Cooper City. I'm Ty Russell, CBS4 News. Okay, Ty, thank you for that. Our team coverage moves now to CBS4's Jim DeFeedy, host of Facing South Florida. Hi, Jim. Hi, Rick. Uh, Hi, uh, Elliot. Very nice to see you. We're joined now by CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe. Ed, I just want to talk to you about a couple of things real quick. Let's, I want to get your sense for what would happen. Let's play both scenarios. What happens if the Democrats take the House? What happens then? 
Then you'll see Democrats immediately launch investigations into a host of issues across the Trump administration. Everything from decisions made on the future of offshore drilling there in Florida to the president's personal finances and taxes to questions about why the Secret Service has to pay rent at places like Mar-a-Lago or Trump Tower here in New York. But you'll also see Democrats pushing for things like an ambitious bipartisan deal on infrastructure spending to rebuild the nation's roads and airports, perhaps a focus on doing something about prescription drug prices, the opioid crisis, and then, of course, negotiations over immigration policy. Does the wall get built and do dreamers get legalized? Those are the kinds of discussions that we should expect to see early next year. All right, let's play the other side of the coin. What happens if Republicans hold on to the House? How much will that embolden the president, and what could we see after that? Totally emboldens the president and Republicans who have vowed to continue finding ways to tweak the Affordable Care Act. But if they've learned one lesson from this election cycle, they understand if they do anything to the nation's health care policy, they've got to protect pre existing condition coverage. That has been a big topic of conversation in races there in Florida and across the country. The other thing you'll see at least the Senate do is continue to confirm conservative justices across the country in courts uh, that need them and possibly have to confirm a whole new slate of cabinet secretaries. Everybody from the attorney general to the interior secretary to the commerce secretary is at risk of losing their job. That kind of work, hearings, investigation, and final confirmation votes can eat up most of the early part of next year, at least for the Senate. Uh, the president earlier today was saying that cabinet turnover isn't unusual after a midterm election, and he may be right, but I think what, you're, what I'm hearing you say is we could expect even more than the typical type of turnover coming up. Yeah, there's been conversation about as many as six or seven cabinet secretaries. Usually you see turnover at the four-year mark if a president gets a second term, not after two years. But two years in the Trump administration, I suppose, is like four years in a normal presidency. And so there's some understandable burnout or at least displeasure from the president with the people he employs. Either way, if Republicans control the Senate next year, those people will ultimately eventually get confirmed. It's just a question of how much hysterics there is around those confirmations. But the personnel business has been so much of the focus of the Senate the last two years, it probably will be at least in the early part of 2019. We've been focused here, obviously, on the governor's race here in Florida with Andrew Gillum against yeah. Ron DeSantis and the history-making process of if Andrew Gillum wins, he becomes the first African-American to be the governor here. But this is also playing out in Georgia in that race. Is it, are we seeing some similar trends that are happening in Georgia as we're seeing here in terms of the tone of that election? Not only in the tone, but also in the style and the strategy used by both parties. They've nominated charismatic partisan warriors, essentially, in both states and in both parties. Nobody's really trying to hug the middle. They are, they are keeping to their corners, believing that if they can run up their base of support enough, they can get over the finish line. Important to remember in Georgia tonight, though, somebody has to get to 50% at least in order to win outright. If they don't, there will be a runoff in early December in Georgia, and the rest of the 49 states will be focused on the nastiness there in the Peach State for at least another month or so. Well, the nice thing is in Florida, at least we know will be done tonight, barring a recount, yes. which I guess Florida is always possible. Ed O'Keefe, I want to thank you very much for your time. And Elliot Rudabay, back to you. All right, guys, thank you very much. And there are some things you need to know if you haven't cast your vote yet. Remember, you must vote at your designated polling site. As long as you're in line by 7 o'clock, you will be allowed to vote. If you have an absentee ballot, you need to either drop it off at elections headquarters or have it canceled at a polling site in order to cast a regular ballot. For more on what you need to know before you vote, head to cpsmiami.com slash election guide. Our CBS 4 News election coverage continues until 630 and that's followed by the CBS Evening News and then a special one hour edition of CBS 4 News at 7. CBS News coverage goes from 8 until 11 and we'll have local election updates all night long and wrap up the day right here at 11. And you can find election results online at cbsmiami.com. Just check out our homepage or go to cbsmiami.com slash election results. Still to come, a look at the other contests being watched around the country, plus how the president is spending election day. That's next. Also, what's being done to ensure the midterm election is secured from hacking? That's ahead. CBS 4 News special coverage of Election Day 2018 will be right back.
our coverage of campaign 2018. Tonight's, tonight, close races across the country could change the makeup of the House and Senate. All 435 House seats are up for grabs, along with 35 out of the 100 Senate seats. Now, both Democrats and Republicans are hoping record early voting turnout means good news for them. The Democrats saying today they're confident they'll win the House. I feel confident uh, that we will win. It's just a question of what the size of victory is. Well, voters will also decide 35 governor's races. Meantime, President Trump has no public events today. He'll be watching the results at the White House later tonight. Tonight, Georgia could elect the nation's first female African-American governor. Democrat Stacey Abrams and Republican Brian Kemp are locked in a tight race there. Voters in Georgia have set a new record with more than 2 million people voting early. If neither Abrams nor Kemp gets more than 50 percent of the vote, they'll go to a runoff in December. And still to come, the Election Day focus on election security, what's being done to make sure your vote counts and it's not hacked later on. Craig Setzer in CBS4 Weather Control. Beautiful day today, a bit on the warm side, nice sunrise and a gentle breeze, and also some humidity out there. The forecast, oh, there's no cold fronts, but maybe, maybe on the horizon. I've got it coming up. I'm Mirabal Rodriguez in the CBS4 studios. Tomorrow on CBS4 this morning, results from all the major races in campaign 2018 will have complete live team coverage as a historic midterm election comes to an end. That and more when you join us starting at 4.30 a.m. right here on CBS4.
Welcome back. We're joined by meteorologist Craig Setzer now. So weather cooperating for people heading to the polls. Weather like cooperating. Yep, yep. I wore my I voted tie. Very nice. I like the, the red, white, and blue also. Yeah. Thanks. I'm trying, trying to stay nonpartisan. Let's show you what's going on outside. We are looking at mostly sunny skies and a pretty warm afternoon. A little bit of a breeze out there. Everglades Holiday Park camera this afternoon. You see the flags on the airboats blowing. Made it up to 85 in Miami, although some spots considerably warmer at the airport just would not warm up as much on the thermometer and normal as 83, so above the normal. 86, Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, and 88, tying the record set back in 1880 for Key West. Here's the radar right now. I'm showing not much activity going on over the mainland. Miami, Dade, and Broward, there are some showers to our southeast that they're going to reach South Florida later on tonight. Some showers over on the west coast, the southwest coast, and some showers right now moving through the lower keys, and that's going to be off and on as we go through the evening. Breeze east to southeast, anywhere from 10 to about 14 miles an hour, and temperatures not too bad, mainly in the mid 80s right now, but humidity levels making the feels like temperatures feel like about 90. Degrees. Satellite loop, you can see the clouds coming in. A few little tiny sprinkles or light showers from a few of those clouds. All in all, they're looking pretty good. This little line right here, that is a cold front that triggered some severe weather last night. It's bringing some rain right now into the panhandle. That is a cold front, but it is not going to be coming through. In fact, it's kind of losing its push there, and we're kind of stuck here in the tropical humidity for November. So here's we go through the week. Friday, Saturday, a little drier in North Florida, Sunday, Monday. Finally, by Tuesday, it does look like a cold front is heading our way. It's not here yet, so we're in warm, hu high humidity air right through the weekend and into early next week. Spotty showers around uh, later on tonight and right now in the Keys, warm and humid, a low near 76. The lower Keys getting the brunt of the evening rainfall. Tomorrow, warm sun, a few showers uh, moving through, high temperature near 86 degrees. Pollen count showing that a mold is medium and palm is low, taking us through the rest of the week. Temperatures stay warm above normal. Highs in the mid and sometimes upper 80s. Some sun and some showers for tomorrow. Spotty showers around on Thursday and the weekend right now. More sun and a few showers here or there, but no cold fronts. Maybe the middle of next week. Back to you. Look forward to that, Craig. Thank you. We've got some uh, breaking news to tell you about right now out of Homestead, where there is a heavy police presence following a deadly shooting. Chopper 4 is over the scene in the 2800 block of Southeast First Drive in Homestead. We're told one person is dead, and they're investigating this as a homicide. We'll continue to follow this breaking news and bring you updates as we get them. And still to come here on CBS 4 News, election security. It's a top concern from the Department of Homeland Security. Have you given it much thought? What you need to know about what the government is doing to protect your vote next. And a reminder, if you see news or weather happening, take a picture. Send it to us. Our email is cbs4pics at cbs.com. And you may see your pictures on TV.
Continuing our coverage of campaign 2018 after Russian meddling in the 2016 election, security is a top concern for officials today. The Department of Homeland Security says it's been working to protect this election from foreign interference. They're also securing voter registration files, election results, and polling places. The Justice Department says it has deployed monitors to voting sites in 19 states, including Florida, and groups like the Nonpartisan Election Protection are stepping up in other states. Officials are very, very comfortable um, pursuing discriminatory voting changes, knowing that the only recourse will be organizations like ours standing up and pushing back in the courts. Officials say they've had two years to get ready for today, so they don't anticipate any issues. People want to make sure those votes are counted and they're counted the right very way. Very right? important. Yeah. And that is CBS 4 News at 430. Live Election Day team coverage begins in two minutes. This is CBS 4 News at 5. Right now at 5, today is the day voters have their say. My opinion matters. That's what I fought for. But we need to know what we're voting for. Lining up to cast their ballots in critical contests that will determine our next governor. Hey, I feel good. It's time to win. Good for you. Thanks for your help. To see you. Appreciate Hard you. To see. Thank you. And representatives in Washington, D.C., Tonight, CBS 4 News live team coverage of Election Day. And live pictures now from Doral, a polling site where we have seen a steady stream of voters coming in and out all day long. Remember, you have until 7 o'clock to get in line and cast your vote. It's not just Floridians who will be watching the results of tonight's races very closely. People around the country will be paying attention to what we decide about who should represent us as our governor, our senator, and members of Congress. The candidates are fanned out across the state, and so are our reporters covering the candidates and how voting is going here at home. We begin in Orlando tonight with CBS 4's Carrie Codd and the Ron DeSantis campaign. Carrie. Good afternoon, Ruta Bay and Elliot. We are inside the ballroom at the Rosen Center Hotel in Orlando. It is all set up for the Ron DeSantis campaign party. Doors will open here at 6 o'clock tonight. I did talk a little while ago with a spokesperson for the DeSantis campaign. He told me after the candidate voted this morning in Jacksonville, he came back to the hotel here to spend some quality time with his family. He will, of course, be watching the returns here and then have this party here this evening. We spent today going around Orlando talking to voters as well as a political analyst here in Florida to get a sense of how this tight race might be decided. 
Ron DeSantis arrived at his polling place near Jacksonville on Election Day to some applause and support from the crowd. Thank you. Appreciate it. Then he and his wife waited in line to cast their votes. DeSantis will watch the returns Tuesday night in Orlando. At polling places across Orlando, turnout appeared steady on Election Day. At Central Parkway Baptist Church, the line stretched out the door. And voters we spoke with, like the candidates for governor, DeSantis and Democrat Andrew Gillum, hold very different views. I voted for uh, the Republican for governor. Keep taxes where they are. Okay, and I think... Uh, his opponent wants to raise taxes. I'm going to be voting for Andrew Gillum. He wants better pay for the teachers. He wants to increase gun control. I'm for that. Election experts like Broward College political science professor Kevin Walsh says the key to a possible DeSantis victory might be unusually high turnout for Republicans in a midterm where their party controls the White House. The Republicans are seem to be uh, more enthusiastic, more energetic than you typically see in these midterm elections. And I think it could be decisive uh, for DeSantis. And no matter who captures the governor's mansion, some voters hope the real winner on Tuesday is compromise. Now we can make uh, compromises and come together and fix what's wrong with our country. I mean, we all identify the same issues. We just have different solutions. Now, I spoke to a couple of other analysts who study Florida politics. They told me they'll also be watching the youth vote closely, the minority vote, how college educated suburban women vote, and also a very important group, the registered independents in Florida. They make up about 27% of Florida's electorate, about three and a half million votes. Now, DeSantis is running against Democrat Andrew Gillum. My colleague Ted Scouton is with the Gillum campaign in Tallahassee. He's up there with a live report. Ted? Hi, Kerry. Well, Andrew Gillum is hoping that his uh, event here at Florida A&M University is going to turn out to be a victory party tonight, but uh, he's going to have some competition with the rain. It's been raining all day uh, throughout the day here in Tallahassee. You can see uh, that's where the stage is set up. It's all covered in plastic uh, because of all the rain. Earlier today, however, he uh, voted uh, here in Tallahassee and urged those who did not vote early to get to the polls. Great. How do you like your chances Feels today? Great. I feel good. Democratic gubernatorial nominee Andrew Gillum finally casting his vote after a very long, nasty campaign. Supporters cheering him on. I'm uh, extremely excited to uh, have just, uh, uh, I guess I can reveal, cast a vote for myself. Uh, uh, Make some noise if you're going to hit them polls tomorrow and vote for Andrew Gillum. With Sean Diddy Combs and other big stars by his side, Gillum campaigned until the very end with a huge rallying concert that went until the early morning hours at FAMU, trying to get every vote he can. If we show up and we vote, the next time I see you, I will greet you as the governor of the great state of Florida. Let's bring it home, everybody. His message resonating with his base. I love his position on the environment. If we don't save Florida, uh, everything else is a moot point, and I really appreciate his position on health care. Gillum is feeling confident going into election night. He has a message for those who did not vote for him. And I'm looking forward to then turning around and going back to those voters who, whose votes uh, I didn't get and letting them know that I plan to be a governor for them, too. And another live look here at Florida A&M University. This is the stage where Andrew Gillum will be tonight. As we said, he's hoping that this is going to be a victory party, but uh, one thing he's going to have to compete with is the rain. There's been a lot of rain here in Tallahassee today. Live in Tallahassee, Ted Scout, CBS 4 News. All right, Ted, thanks a lot. Now you've heard from the men who want to be governor, we want to take you to the polls. Yeah, they've been busy in Miami-Dade and Broward counties. We have team coverage of how things are going, beginning with CBS 4's Lisa Petrillo, live in Doral. Lisa. Hi there. Yeah, with over 5 million that have pre-voted all over the state of Florida, it's been kind of a mellow day, but they're showing up more now that it's becoming after the 5 o'clock hour. We're here at the Miami-Dade Fire Rescue 69 here in Doral. We've been all over South Florida today as Miami-Dade comes out to vote and take notice. Voters all over Miami-Dade County doing their part to make their voices count. Everybody needs to vote. That's your, not only your right, but it's expected for you as a citizen. 
Aside from the highly charged governor and senator races, plus local races, voters were dealing with 12 Florida constitutional amendments. So reviewing your ballot for the very first time in the voting booth is not a good idea. Voter preparedness is really important in this election, both from a voter education standpoint, but also, also to expedite your experience at the poll. Here at FIU South Campus, Next Gen America was here to bus students from the school to the precincts and back. Next Gen America is the largest youth vote mobilization campaign in the country, and our goal is to get 18 to 35 year olds registered to vote and now actually out to the polls to vote. Those who voted today were excited. A lot of attention being drawn from people of my generation this year for, to vote, which is really awesome. Yeah. A lot of the time I feel like it's the older people and it's actually these policies and these people are going to affect us just as much. It's an opportunity for me to just go ahead and participate in our community and I feel really good about it. Over at the University of Miami, it was much the same feeling. All the rallies leading up to this was a very good and got the word out and let people know, hey, if you don't vote, you can't really say much. And they emphasize it a lot, like the, at our school, everyone's like, go out and vote, and they do a really good job of getting people out here to vote. Right. It is important. All right, so you have a little less than two hours. We have heard some people have been turned away because they didn't bring this, your license. So make sure you do it. You have under two hours to get here. And when the line will cut off at 7 o'clock, if you are in line before 7, you can vote up until then. We'll be back at 6 o'clock with another report. Back to you in the studio. Important to know. Lisa, thank you for that update from Doral. Our team coverage moves now to CBS 4's Dave Warren. He is live tonight in Fort Lauderdale with what's happening there. Dave. Yes, uh, there's a lot of energy here from the uh, excitement from the early voting, that record turnout. Uh, but a lot of people now starting to fill into the Coral Ridge Mall, this uh, after work rush. There's also a lot of volunteers out here, here picking up the signs and all the activity is going on here now today. Now it's been steady, hasn't been overly crowded, but overall there's been very few problems here. Let's check in with the rest of the county. After record early voting, the time has come for those who waited to do so. Seeing lines in a midterm election is, I mean, I can't even describe the feeling. Here at Coral Ridge Mall, that feeling was hardly impatient. There were just a few waiting for the polls to open, and once inside, everything seemed to move smoothest, provided you were at the right place. Long that same can't be said for a location in Deerfield Beach. A polling location was located inside a gated community. The problem, other precincts that vote there were outside of that. I have totally addressed this many, many times since the primaries when I was the clerk here in August, and nobody's done anything about it yet. Everybody's got to show ID? Yes, sir. To enter an independent security company asked for ID. A few declined and were delayed, but eventually allowed to vote. But that delay backed traffic up all the way out to the main road. Now, according to Brenda Snipes, nobody was prevented from voting at that location. Overall, it seemed that things were running smoothly for those that waited until election day to vote. Exercising their right to have a voice. And for a few today, that reminds them of the sacrifices made for that right. I lost some other friends over there. <laughs> if you don't vote, what's it all about? Yeah, so a lot of emotion uh, here as people walked out of that polling place. Now, part of this story was reported in conjunction with Pro Publicus Edu Election Project. Uh, that monitors voting problems here around the country. But here we are at Coral Ridge Mall. People going in, people coming out, no significant problems. Crowds picking up just a bit with a little less than two hours to go. Uh, here we're live at Coral Ridge Mall. Dave Warren, back to you. Good to see you, Dave. Thank you for that report. And while today is Election Day, new early voting numbers are being reported by the State Elections Department. The number is going up because vote by mail ballots are still coming in. 5.2 million Floridians cast a vote either in person or by mail. More than a million of those voters cast their votes in Miami-Dade, Broward and Monroe counties. And there are some things you need to know if you have not cast your vote yet. Remember, you must vote at your designated polling site today. And as long as you are in line at 7 o'clock, we've said it over and over, you will be allowed to vote. If you have an absentee ballot, you need to either drop it off at election headquarters or have it canceled at a polling site in order to cast a regular ballot today. For more on what you need to know before you vote, go to cbsmiami.com slash election guide. Our coverage of Election Day 2018 doesn't end here. Still to come, a look at the other races being watched closely around the country. And where is President Donald Trump today? That's in our next half hour.
I'm David Sutta in Naples with the Scott campaign. It has been the most expensive midterm campaign in the history of not just Florida, but the country. Will it be enough? The story is straight ahead in a live report from Naples. I'm Joan Murray in Orlando with the Democratic Florida Senator Bill Nelson camp. Can he bring it home? I'll have that story straight ahead. Craig Setzer and CBS4 Weather Control, where it has been a nice day across South Florida and the Keys, warm, humid, and even tropical looking. I'm going to look at your forecast through the weekend and when do we see another cold front that's coming up. Now back to our coverage of campaign 2018 and our focus is turning now to the Senate showdown. Incumbent Senator Bill Nelson is taking on Republican Governor Rick Scott in one of the most closely watched races in the country. CBS 4's David Sutta kicks off our team coverage with the Scott campaign. He's live tonight in Naples. David. Yeah, this is one of those races that everyone is watching closely because it's not just the polls that have this neck and neck. It is the history with Governor Scott. He's always had close calls on every one of his election nights. Of course, he's not allowed just two of them, but nonetheless, it's always been close. As you see the podium behind me, he's hoping to take that podium tonight to announce that he's going to be moving from Tallahassee to Washington, D.C. We'll have to see. He spent the day traveling around the state. Let's go ahead and show you some video of his stop in Orlando. He was in Tampa, Orlando, and Jacksonville. 
in Pensacola, uh, basically thanking all of the volunteers for coming out on his behalf. Uh, it has been a long campaign and an expensive one at that. These are the areas, though, those cities where a large base of Republicans are, and they are going to need to turn out for him to have a chance to win tonight. Scott does have that history of close races here. In uh, 2010, he won by just 64,000 votes. And then you look back to 2014, the midterm against Charlie Crist, he won that one by 64,000 votes. We caught up with him today and asked him about why he thinks now is an opportunity to unseat a Democrat who's held the seat for 17 years. Ultimately, it becomes a clear choice. Um, Bill Nelson, uh, he doesn't want to work. You know, he's been there for 42 years. He can't name anything he's ever done. Everybody knows I want to work. It, you know, he, nobody wants their taxes going up. He's voted for higher taxes over 300 times. Uh, my grandson told me, he called me, he says, Grandpa, I want you to win because you let people keep their money. And, you know, he, Bill Nelson didn't have a plan. Um, I've got a plan, includes term limits. Because, and, and Bill Nelson needs to be term limited. He's not, he's not doing anything for us. Who's tired of all of those campaign ads? I'm sure many of you are. I can tell you that this has been one of the most expensive uh, midterm campaigns in the history of Florida and the country. 180 million plus spent here. That's a lot of commercials on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and all of that uh, coming from both sides. Uh, Governor Scott actually spent 60 plus million dollars out of his own pocket for this campaign. It was something that uh, Senator Bill Nelson had a challenge to compete with. He also had to compete with the fact that uh, the president was in. Endorsing Rick Scott and obviously campaigning on that. With more on Bill Nelson's side of things, I'm going to be joined now by my fantastic colleague, Joan Murray, who is in Orlando with uh, the Nelson camp. Joan, how are things looking there? Uh, good, David. And the watch party hasn't started here yet at the Embassy Suites. We're told the senator is at home and will not be here until this race is decided. This is a real nail biter and probably his toughest comp competition yet. Election day in Orlando, and it's steady at the polls. Democratic Florida Senator Bill Nelson, who voted early, made no campaign appearances as he defends his seat against sitting Governor Rick Scott. Education, health care, the environment, you know what's at stake. Up until today, Nelson has been crisscrossing Florida, making stops at big Democratic events, promoting his record, his Florida roots, and trustworthiness. Last week, he was in Miami, where President Obama was stumping for Democrats. I feel like in Florida, it's definitely been a lot of environmental stuff. Donald Gianta, a Democrat and millennial, said the election is hot on social media. It's gone away from the what I'm going to do and what I'm going to own and what I hope to accomplish to what they've done or their track record or I think there's too much emphasis on the past and not enough on what I'm doing now and what it can do. For other voters, this Senate race is about deciding which candidate may have an impact on their daily lives. Well, I'm looking for something that actually affect me directly. Anything having to do with the health insurance, um, like about the cost of living in Orlando area, Central Florida, if it's going to affect me and that sort of thing. And we may know soon in this contentious Senate race that's been too close to call. And this is a must win for the Democratic Party if they hope to gain control of the U.S. Senate. Now, yesterday, the senator was on street corners in Orlando and Melbourne waving signs, uh, greeting voters here in the central part of Florida. He said he is feeling pretty good and believes tonight will be his night. We shall see and bring you all the results as they become available. In Orlando, Joan Murray, CBS4 News. Joan, thanks a lot for that. And joining us now is Jim Defeaty, the host of Facing South Florida, who lives for nights like this <laughs> election night. Feel the uh, energy. This, this, this should be every night. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, do you think that the governor's race has overshadowed the Senate race? There's a Senate race? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, absolutely. Look, and I think there's a, there's a natural reason why that's taking place. You know, Rick Scott and Bill Nelson are fairly well-known names. They're, they're people who we're used to. There's nothing new about them. But then you talk about the governor's race, and you got two new candidates. But this Senate race is critical. I mean, you're seeing just how many people are coming in, the president coming in, the, both president, President Obama, current President Donald Trump. So it's a pivotal race for sure. What does it mean on a national level if Senator Bill Nelson doesn't win? 
If, if Bill Nelson loses this race, then even the narrow shot that Republic, or that Democrats had of winning over the Senate goes out the window. Uh, Bill Nelson winning is the first step. Even if he wins, it's still a long shot for them to take it back. But clearly, if he loses, that, that, that idea is done. You know, Mitchell will be the majority leader again. The Democrats can't take the Senate without Bill Democrats Nelson. Democrats cannot take back the Senate without Bill Nelson. And apparently, Governor Scott has written checks totaling 60 million million dollars for this election? Sixty million dollars. This is something that, that he is able to do is put money in at the last minute. And actually, we don't even know. There could be even more late checks that could have been written in the last 48 hours that we won't know about. But that's the ability that he has. That's what always makes him a scary candidate. OK, let's turn now to the governor's race. Mm -hmm. uh, what race does this remind you of? So I, I've been thinking a lot about this. And in a, in a lot of ways, I think that this is a tale of two races. On the Republican side, Ron DeSantis is clear Clearly running a very 2016 Donald Trump type election. And on the Democratic side, you got Andrew Gillum running very much in the spirit of Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012. That's not something that Hillary Clinton did in, in 2016. Hillary Clinton ran a negative campaign against Donald Trump. Andrew Gillum is trying to run a campaign being more positive, be forward thinking, talking about the future of the state and where they can bring things together. Ron DeSantis is, is pointing out all the concerns that you would have with a with a president or with a with a uh, Andrew Gillum as governor, so it's really a tale of two elections, and it's going to have huge ramifications for 2020. We'll see which tactic works tonight. Yeah. Jim, thanks a lot. And David Beckham and Jorge Moss greeted Miami residents today as voters decided whether to approve a soccer stadium deal. A vote on Miami Freedom Park would allow Beckham's MLS soccer group to lease city-owned land for a soccer stadium. Some residents are concerned, though, about protecting the Mallory's golf course and the elimination of green space as well as potential traffic problems. Supporters say the park provides more than enough green space, which would be free to everyone, unlike golf. Now, CBS4 weather with Chief Meteorologist Craig Setzer. Sun setting in the west now, getting very, very low on the horizon. Our Glentale Park camera looking down the canals there where the wind starting to drop off a bit. But going to be a nice evening across South Florida. 81 right now in Miami, 82 Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, 85 in Key West after a high today of 88 in the lower keys, uh, tying the record. Six on the stickiness scale, making it feel like 86 right now. East, southeast breeze and no rain, although we have a, just a little bit of shower activity across the area. Showers right now moving their way through the lower keys and off the seven mile bridge there. Middle and upper keys looking pretty Pretty good through the evening and the mainland looking pretty good as well. Miami Dade and Broward, but there are some more showers farther to the southeast that'll be here later tonight. Temperatures once again in the low to mid 80s right now. It feels like temperatures pretty warm with the humidity levels where they are. It feels like mid 80s to right around 90 degrees statewide. It's been a warm day, 80s north to south. Cold fronts pushed into the panhandle and some showers and thunderstorms there. Temperatures presently in the 70s. The satellite map in motion showing that mix of sun and clouds over us and those thunderstorms up in the panhandle. That cold front is not making it here to South Florida. We're waiting for two more. Maybe that third one will get through. Spotty showers around, especially later on tonight, a low near 76. Tomorrow, look for warm sun and a few showers from time to time. Shouldn't be too big of a deal, but you may need to keep an umbrella handy. High near 86 for boaters. Winds out of the east at 10. Seas running two feet or less. A light chop on the bays and through the rest of the week. A little better chance for showers tomorrow. An even better chance on Thursday. And then we stay warm, of course, and a chance of some showers through the weekend kind of stuck in this pattern here until the next cold front comes through. Back to you. All right, thank you very much. And still to come, we're on top of the other big news of the day, including a deadly wrong way wreck overnight on I-75. What happened after the break? Also, a high school security guard arrested and facing drug charges. Details on the arrest next. And control of Congress is up for grabs tonight with some key races being watched here in South Florida. That's in our next half hour.
The all clear has been given after a suspicious package scare in Fort Lauderdale. It was found outside a post office on Las Olas Boulevard. Several businesses were evacuated as a precaution. The bomb squad checked it out and then gave the all clear. A judge has ordered the man accused of mailing more than a dozen mail bombs to be held without bond. Cesar Sayak, who is from South Florida, made his first appearance in a New York City federal court today. He's facing five federal charges, and if he's convicted, he could spend nearly 50 years in prison. Sayak will be back in court next Monday. Now at 5, police are investigating a deadly wrong way crash. It happened overnight on I-75 near US-27 in Western Broward County. Florida Highway Patrol says a woman in a Honda Civic was driving the wrong way when she slammed into a pickup truck. 23-year-old Flavia Pinto died at the scene. Two people inside the pickup truck suffered serious injuries. Traffic homicide investigators are on scene continue to collect all the evidence, gather at the scene. It's a, it's a massive scene right now. We have two vehicles that are destroyed. A third vehicle was also involved, but the injuries to the two people in that car were minor. Detectives are investigating whether alcohol was a factor. A high school security guard is behind bars tonight. Police say that 43-year-old Jamie Green is accused of dealing cocaine and marijuana. Police say he works at Felix Verla High School in Miami-Dade County. Detectives raided his home and found nearly 30 grams of cocaine, according to police, and nearly 800 grams of marijuana. He's been denied bond and is facing numerous drug charges. Now back to our coverage of campaign 2018 and voting in the midterm election now underway across the state. Remember, you have until 7 tonight to cast your vote, and it must be at your designated polling location. Among the races being decided tonight, who will represent South Florida in Congress? The candidates in several key races hit the ground running today, hoping to sway the races their way. The choices made tonight will determine the balance of power in the House of Representatives. We have CBS 4 News live team coverage of the big races. We begin with CBS 4's Peter Dench and the race to replace retiring Congresswoman Ileana ross Leighton. Peter. Rhoda Bay, both candidates are running for office for the first time. Former broadcast journalist Maria Elvira Salazar stressing her ties to this heavily Hispanic district. Meanwhile, former U.N. President Donna Shalala is, is uh, stressing her experience with and knowledge of key issues, including health care and immigration reform. As Donna Shalala casts her ballot at Coral Gables Fire Station 3, she says she'll fight for stronger health care. This administration is making war on pre-existing conditions and on Obamacare. 100,000 people in this district have Obamacare, and uh, they want to keep it. Shalala is impressed by long lines of young voters. That's a good sign for America, because frankly, it's their election. It's their future. Shalala's running against Republican Maria Elvira Salazar to replace Ileana ross Leighton, who is retiring. At Salazar casts her vote at the Jose Marti Park Gymnasium in Little Havana. She stresses her ties to the community. I know what's going on in the countries of origin. For the Nicaraguans and for the Venezuelans and for the Colombians and for the Haitians and for the Cubans, it's very important for them to have somebody that will represent them in Washington that knows what's going on in their countries of origin. And I am that person, not only because I speak Spanish. It has nothing to do with the language. It has to do with the culture. Now, the 56-year-old Salazar has stressed that her knowledge of Latin American affairs is very important, as well as her energy. Meanwhile, Shalala, who is 77, has been Health and Human Services Secretary for eight years under President Bill Clinton. We're live at Coral Gables. Peter Dench, CBS 4 News. Peter, thanks for the update from the Gables. Another race to watch is the contest between these two, incumbent Republican Carlos Curbelo and his Democratic challenger, Debbie Mercasell Powell. CBS 4's Hank Tester kicks off our team coverage of this race. He is with the Curbelo camp in southwest Miami-Dade. Hank? Well, Elliot, this is a story of two really nice people who are saying awful things about each other. That's one story. The other one here, of course, is a big one. The nation is watching this particular race. Will the blue wave happen? Will it start here? This is a fascinating contest, and who's going to win? Really hard to tell. Let's take a look. Republican U.S. Congressman Carlos Cabello at the polls early this election day. 
He's the incumbent in Florida Congressional District 26. Curbelo is a moderate Republican who represents a district that has steadily gone blue in recent years. Curbelo was reelected in 2016 by 12 points, but Hillary Clinton won the district by 16 points. For that reason, Democrats looked at Curbelo's district as one that's up for grabs, and they've poured millions into the campaign of Debbie Powell in an attempt to unseat Carlos Curbelo. The district stretches across Kendall, Westchester, South Miami-Dade, includes all of the Florida Keys. $20 million has been spent by both sides in this contest, most of it on television political ads. Polls rate the nasty race as a toss-up. Carvello says voters are fed up. They want people in Washington to work together. They want the politicians to put the nasty partisanship aside and get good things done for this community and for the country. Well, back live, talking around here and elsewhere in the community today, no one really has a feel on this race. Frankly, right now, consider it a toss-up. I'm Hank Tester, CBS4 News. Back to you. Certainly looks like that one, uh, Hank. Thank you. We move now to CBS4's Mike Cunha. He is live with Debbie Mercosel Powell's camp in down in Southwest Miami-Dade. Mike. Hey guys, we're at Black Point Ocean Grill. Supporters and organizers are starting to get things ramped up here. Everyone, including the candidates, supposed to be here around 7, 7.30. As you heard Hank Tester just say, this is going to be a hotly contested uh, race. It's going to be a toss-up, which is why Debbie Mercosau Powell herself spent the morning doing some last-minute campaigning. District 26 is about as hotly contested as they come. Newcomer Debbie Mukersell Powell's attempt to knock off two-term Congressman Carlos Curbelo has been an expensive one. The two sides, along with outside groups, spending more than $20 million. Money Mukersell Powell knows hasn't fallen on deaf ears. There's definitely a feeling of hope that we can actually get our country and put it back on track. Um, I think that it's very exciting. I get a lot of good energy right now. I hope to get your support today. She's been campaigning to the last minute, today bouncing around from voting site to voting site. Mukerso Powell's been running on gun reform and the environment, but her main point of focus has been on health care and the Affordable Care Act, something Curbelo voted against. And when Carlos Curbelo took that vote to threaten to take away health care for more than 100,000 families in this community, I knew I had to step in. This race will be tight. Even though Hillary Clinton won the district in the general by 16 points, Curbelo, who's no stranger to reaching across the aisle, won in 2016 by 12 points. I have full confidence that my community understands what's at stake in this election and that they're going to come out and lift their voices up to bring about change. Now, that $20 million figure you keep hearing for this race, that's a record for a Florida congressional race. Mike Cunio, CBS4 News. We are breaking and setting records tonight. Mike Cunio, thank you. Our team coverage moves north to Broward County and CBS Force Ty Russell. Ty is live tonight with more on the fight for Debbie Wasserman Schultz's congress congressional seat. Ty. Ruta Bay and Elliot, the congresswoman, is not here at her campaign headquarters just yet. She was out today talking to voters at the last minute to try to get some more votes. That's because she is facing two opponents who have tried to unseat her before. Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz is fighting to keep her seat in Florida's 23rd district, which covers portions of Broward and Miami-Dade counties. We'll know that if they want someone who will stand up for Medicare and Social Security and their, protect their retirement, making sure they elect Democrats all across the uh, all across the country. She has been outspoken against President Trump, which is why the FBI says pipe bomber suspect Caesar Sayoc used her name on packages and sent them to several critics of the president ahead of the midterms. Her opponent, former Democrat, now independent candidate Tim Canova, hopes he can rack up enough votes to unseat the congresswoman. I've been going around the district uh, to polling place after polling place, and it's been very encouraging. Wherever we go, we have a lot of supporters. A lot of people want change. That's very clear. Canova ran as a Democrat in the primary but lost. He also ran for the seat in 2016. Canova and Wasserman Schultz are also facing Republican Joe Kaufman who has run against the congresswoman three times before. There's way too much uh, standardized testing, uh, way, too, way too little uh, vocational training. Kids need to have a good work ethic, and, uh, and that starts from the ground up. Now, there are no official polls for this race, but each candidate we talked to tonight said they will win. But of course, it's up to the voters. They will have the final say. We are live in Cooper City tonight. I'm Ty Russell, CBS4 News.
Ty, thank you. And there are some things you need to know. If you haven't cast your vote yet, remember you must vote at your designated polling site. And as long as you are in line by 7 o'clock, you will be allowed to vote. If you have an absentee ballot, you need to either drop it off at elections headquarters or have it canceled at a polling site in order to cast your regular ballot. For more on what you need to know before you vote, head to cbsmiami.com slash election guide. Our CBS 4 News election coverage continues until 6.30, and that's followed by CBS Evening News and then a special one-hour edition of CBS 4 News at 7. CBS News coverage goes from 8 until 11, and we'll have local election updates all night long and wrap up the day right here at 11. And you can find election results online at cbsmiami.com. Just check out our homepage or go to cbsmiami.com slash election results. Every Tuesday on CBS 4 News, even on Election Day, we share stories about why mentoring matters and how it makes a difference. Men and women looking for a good paying, stable job with the ability to move anywhere in the country might have an option they didn't know about right here in Miami. It's in the construction industry. One Florida company helping develop one of Miami's newest urban areas with on the job experience, even paying for your school. You got both of you did really well. Miami World Center is one of downtown Miami's newest and largest developments. Condos, restaurants, retail shops, and so much more on 27 acres in the heart of Miami. You can see animated renditions of what Miami World Center will look like when it's all done. Bring them down so that we can get you guys set up. One of the key projects is the 700-foot Paramount condo building, currently under construction. And those helping to wire the building are apprentices like Jared Breitenstein. Jared is a U.S. Navy veteran who served in Afghanistan, and his goal is to become a certified engineer. Jared joined the apprentice program nearly a year ago after serving as an intelligence specialist with the Navy. I was unemployed for quite a while trying to find a job after the military. I was too qualified for some jobs, not qualified enough for others. And so I really wanted the opportunity to learn a trade. That's where Christopher Riley steps in as Jared's boss and mentor. Riley is the project executive for Power Design Incorporated here at the Paramount Condos. The beauty is the company pays for the apprenticeship fees and the actual credits and program curriculum qualifies towards credit for a bachelor's degree. You are qualified to take your journeyman's license to become a journeyman electrician. On this project, that's $21 an hour for a first year apprentice, up to $44 for a journeyman electrician. And for this veteran and father of three boys, it means so much more. This is an opportunity to kind of change your life around. He had no experience in the industry, but he is a U.S. Navy veteran. He has an aptitude for learning, and he's well on his way to learning our industry. He's doing really well so far. So is Jasmine McWilliams, who grew up in nearby Alapata. She's had several jobs over the years with little or no success, until she also met Christopher Riley, and he took her under his wing. She came with a code book in her bag and says, I want to be the first female superintendent at Power Design. The apprentice this program takes five years. Jasmine did it in two. I put it on by studying a lot yeah. and reading a lot and watching videos. So I didn't get that panel to the left. But that's it. And when she's not working on big buildings, Chris makes sure to give advice not only about the job but on life goals as well. He accepted me for me. He talks about saving the money for houses and important things, building credit. I've been good with that, and I was able to uh, get me a car. During our interview, Jasmine is brought to tears when talking about the support she's received, especially being young and female in a male-dominated industry. Thank you for not looking down on me and turning your back on me. I'm actually happy. I'm not sad, I'm happy. I'm very proud that she took her journeyman's exam and passed it. I have no doubt that in two years, if you come back and check on Jared and Jasmine, they will be well on their way to that point. So good to see. Power Design Incorporated is based out of St. Petersburg. It has about 200 apprentices working on projects all over the country. And toward their certification, 28 of them are right here at the Miami World Center going up in downtown Miami. Executives tell us they plan to add another 200 apprentice positions nationwide. 
For information how you can become a mentor, head over to our website, cbsmiami.com slash mentoringmatters, and tell us about the mentors in your life. Email us at mentoringmatters at cbs.com. Isn't this great? It's amazing. It's so heartwarming, and I'm so happy for her being a woman in that male-dominated yeah, field. Yeah, these are good-paying jobs. These are trades that, you know, will last a lifetime in these skills. Well, good to it. see. Still to come, a look at the other contests being watched around the country on this election day. Plus, how President Trump is spending this election day is also next. Also, what's being done to ensure the midterm election is secured from hacking? That's ahead. CBS 4 News special coverage of Election Day 2018 will be right back. our campaign coverage of campaign 2018 and tonight close races across the country could be the change uh, could change the makeup of the House and Senate. All 435 House seats are up for grabs, along with 35 out of the 100 Senate seats. Yeah, a lot at stake here. Both Democrats and Republicans are hoping record early voting turnout means good news for them. And Democrats say today they're confident they'll win the House. I feel confident uh, that we will win. It's just a question of what the size of the victory is. Well, Republicans are pretty confident about the Senate. Voters will also decide 35 governor's races. And President Trump has no public events today. He will be watching the results at the White House tonight.
Tonight, Georgia could elect the nation's first female African-American governor. Democrat Stacey Abrams and Republican Brian Kemp are locked in a tight race. Voters in Georgia have set a new record with more than 2 million people voting early. If neither Abrams nor Kemp gets more than 50 percent of the vote, they'll go to a runoff in December. Still to come, the election day focus on election security, what's being done to make sure your vote counts and it's not hacked later on. Craig Setzer and CBS4 Weather Control. Wow, look at the sunset coming in this evening from our Keys Cam. Even though the sun is below the horizon, the sky looks like a postcard. I've got your postcard warm forecast coming up. I'm Mirabal Rodriguez in the CBS4 studios. Tomorrow on CBS4 this morning, results from all the major races in campaign 2018 will have complete live team coverage as a historic midterm election comes to an end. That and more when you join us starting at 4.30 a.m. right here on CBS4. Craig is here, and anybody who did not vote today cannot use the weather as an excuse. No, unless you were heat and sun resistant and didn't <laughs> like that. But yeah, we're too sensitive to that. Let's show you what's going on outside right now. Here's our Broward camera, downtown Fort Lauderdale, looking off to the mountains in the west.
No, no, no. We're not in Colorado, but kind of looks like uh, mountains. There's some low clouds on the horizon. The high cirrus clouds are being backlit by the sun, looking pretty good in pink. And it's a nice evening. Temperatures for highs today made it into the mid 80s, 85 in Miami. The low this morning, 73. Above the normals of 83 and 70, Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, 86. The high, 76. A very warm overnight low. And Key West tied the record for the date with 88. Tying the record set way back in 1880 of also 88. Here's the temperatures over the past week. And you can see when the cold fronts come through, we get a little bit of a southerly wind ahead of the front. So last Friday, we warmed up to 88 and then cooled off a bit on Saturday to 83. We had the rain then. And then now we're kind of stuck in the mid 80s, but I think temperatures aren't going to change too much in the coming days. And the radar showing things are dry right now, but some showers well to our southeast headed our way. So we'll see some spotty showers again this evening uh, in the mainland and over the Keys right now. The few showers we've had are beginning to thin out just a bit. Temperatures over the southeast, not too bad, mainly in the 60s and 70s and even some 80s down into Florida. And no big cold fronts on the horizon for tonight. Some spotty showers, especially later on with a low near 76 tomorrow. Warm sun, a few showers, high temperature near 86 degrees for pollen sufferers. It may be palm, which remains low, but the mold is medium and taking us through the rest of the weekend of the weekend. A little better chance for showers tomorrow, a better chance on Thursday. And right now the weekend looking like a mix of sun and some showers, warm temperatures and humid back to you. Craig, thank you. Still to come, election security, it's a top concern for the Department of Homeland Security. Have you given it much thought? What you need to know about what the government is doing next. Election Day brings David Beckham to town. Voters are deciding whether his team's plan for a soccer stadium complex should move forward. Hear what he said today, all new at 6. On tonight's CBS Evening News, on this election day, we will have the latest exit poll information. What voters nationwide are telling us brought them to the polls today. Analysis in studio with CBS News Elections Director Anthony Salvanzo and also CBS This Morning co-hosts John Dickerson and Nur O'Donnell. That is tonight on the CBS Evening News. Welcome back. Millions of Americans are headed to the polls in campaign 2018. And with election security on the minds of many in the wake of Russian meddling in the 2016 presidential campaign. As CBS 4's Meg Oliver reports, the government is on alert for any new signs of interference. 
This is the first nationwide voting since Russia targeted the last U.S. presidential election, and millions of Americans are making their voices heard. I'm hoping that even my little vote can help make some change. The Department of Homeland Security says it's been working behind the scenes to protect this midterm election from foreign interference. I have a simple message for any foreign adversary who seeks to interfere or impact our elections. Do not try. In addition to blocking foreign influence, the Homeland Security Office is responsible for election security closer to home. That includes protecting voter registration files, election results, and polling places. There's a steady flow of voters here in New York City. New York is one of 19 states where the Justice Department deployed monitors from the Civil Rights Division to make sure voting laws are upheld. Throughout those states, 35 precincts are under watch to make sure all citizens have access to the ballot. Monitors are looking for signs of discrimination or intimidation. At this time, we have no indication of compromise to our nation's election infrastructure that would prevent voting, change vote counts, or distrust the ability to tally votes. Security officials point out they've had two years to get ready for this day. They're hoping problems are limited to long lines and isolated technical glitches. Meg Oliver, CBS News, New York. So long lines hopefully That's, are a good thing. Yes. All right, and that is CBS 4 News at 5.30. This is CBS 4 News at 6. Now at 6, a live look from a polling location in Doral where there has been a steady stream of people. Much the same story in Broward County. This is a polling site at the Coral Ridge Mall in Fort Lauderdale. South Florida votes on Election Day, campaign 2018, and the polls close in just about an hour. But remember, if you are in line at 7 o'clock, you have to be able to vote. We have a team of reporters fanned out across the state on this Election Day. Let's begin with the closely watched governor's race. CBS 4's Ted Scouten is with the Gillum campaign in Tallahassee. Great. How do you like your chances Feels today? Great. I feel good. It's time to win. Nothing left to do. Final message to voters today. Go vote. Andrew Gillum casting his ballot after doing all he could to get his supporters to the polls. I am extremely proud that we ran a campaign uh, focused on expanding access to health care, paying teachers what they're worth, leaning into the green economy. Even until the end, Gillum took his progressive message to parts of the state where it was not popular. Uh, talking to folks that are part of the state that, you know, a lot of folks don't think might go my way, but that's okay because what I want folks over there to know, including in the deepest red areas, is that I want to be their governor too. Charles Zeldin is a political science professor at Nova Southeastern University. He believes going after people who don't normally vote Democrat is a good strategy. If these non-traditional voters, young voters, women voters who might have voted Republican in the past but might vote Democrat now. If they show up and continue to show up on Tuesday, Gillum's in a really good situation. If they don't show up, he's going to lose by a point or two. And here's a look at Florida A&M University. This is outside. This is where Andrew Gillum is hoping to have a victory party later on. However, it's quite soggy. There's been a lot of rain here. Now, his opponent, Ron DeSantis, he'll be watching election results in Orlando. That's where CBS 4's Kerry Codd is. Kerry? Yes, we are inside a ballroom at the Rosen Center Hotel in Orlando. The doors just opened here for the DeSantis campaign party. If you want to pan off to the side here, Rudy, you can show some of that. The first visitors have started to trickle in here. Of course, uh, the polls close 7 o'clock, and the majority of Florida will begin learning some of the results probably after 7 o'clock. Now, as we've been following the DeSantis campaign over the last couple days and speaking with his folks, we know they feel very confident that even though more Democratic voters returned ballots in early voting, that DeSantis felt that his core supporters would turn out to vote today. We went out to some of the polling places in Orlando to speak to people about how they feel on Election Day. Thanks for your help. Appreciate you. Republican gubernatorial candidate Ron DeSantis cast his ballot at his polling place near Jacksonville Tuesday morning. With his wife and kids by his side, DeSantis waited in line to vote. It was a similar scene at the Central Parkway Baptist Church in Orlando, where the line to vote stretched out the door. Nick Puglia is voting for Democrat Andrew Gillum. Medicare for all, it's really important, I think. I like have a pre existing condition. DeSantis wants to get rid of that. Puglia likes Gillum's spirit and style. 
He's yeah. strong, like, and I feel he knows how to tr uh, debate a Trump like uh, supporter or a Trump uh, candidate. He's the only one that calls them out when they're lying. Delilah Allen told us she's voting for DeSantis. She believes in Republican values, especially when it comes to guns. That's my main thing. I'm like, nobody's taking away my guns. I don't have a gun, but it's the point saying that I don't have the freedom of that. Juan Cuervo did not want to say who he voted for, but he said his main issue is protecting teachers. My teachers in high school were the best that I could have ever asked for, and. Uh, I think that they deserve uh, higher pay. The differences between DeSantis and Gillum are wide. Both men represent divergent paths forward for Florida on taxes, education, and the environment. Political analyst and professor Kevin Walsh will be closely watching to see how certain demographic groups vote. And the minority vote is going to be key. Uh, young voters, the key for Andrew Gillum, he's very good at energizing, he's electrifying that base of, of support. But it may very well come down to uh, educated women uh, in some of these swing districts. And around the ballroom here at the Rosen Center Hotel are large pictures of DeSantis campaigning and throughout uh, different times during the campaign. Now, another key demographic that folks are going to be watching tonight are independents. In the state of Florida, there are three and a half million registered independents. That's about 27 percent of the electorate. The question is, will younger independents turn out for Democrats? Will, will older independents and maybe some other core demographics turn out for Republicans? That's one of the many things that folks are going to be watching as the results begin to trickle in this evening. Live in Orlando, Kerry Codd, CBS 4 News. Kerry, thank you. And our election day team coverage continues now with a Senate showdown between incumbent Bill Nelson and Governor Rick Scott. It's not only one of the nation's more high profile Senate races, it's also the most expensive with more than $173 million spent. We have news crews with the candidates. CBS 4's David Sutta is with the Scott campaign in Naples. But first, let's check in with CBS 4's Joan Marie. She is in Orlando with the Nelson campaign. Joan. And this watch party hasn't started just yet. The chief of staff just made an announcement saying that uh, they have some early indications that over in Hillsborough and Pinellas counties on the West Coast that it's leaning Democratic. But as we've seen again and again in Florida, it is not over till it's over. Education, health care, the environment, you know what's at stake. That's been incumbent Florida Senator Bill Nelson's message for months as he fights to hold on to his Senate seat in what's been a hotly contested race with sitting Governor Rick Scott. I think not only this race, but just forever. It's a bloodbath. Question is, how does all that negativity play with the voter? I try to not pay attention to the ads and just try to look at what they've done and what, what they're trying to say they're going to do instead of looking at the ads because the ads aren't always bought out by the candidates themselves, it's special interest groups and things like that. I'm looking for something that actually affect me directly, anything having to do with the health insurance, um, like about the cost of living in Orlando area, Central Florida, if it's going to affect me and that sort of thing. And it's no status quo for first time voter Xavier Orton, who said he has no party affiliation. Honestly, I think change is always best. Because as life, life goes on, you just need to change something. Some can't be as repetitive as, you know, it just won't work out as well. Bill Nelson will know soon whether he'll serve another six years in the Senate or lose his seat. Chief of Staff said he expects a long, interesting night. Now, the challenger, Rick Scott, was in Orlando today. Um, he's going to end up in Naples, and that's where we find our David Sutta. David, what's the picture in Naples? Joan, I have great news to report tonight, and that is that all of the campaign ads are about to end. That's right, car commercials are coming back. They're going to start selling tomorrow. This campaign and Nelson's campaign have been responsible for putting a lot of ads on TV, on social media. The reason for it, it's going to be close, at least by Scott's campaign's measure. He has always won his elections by less than 64,000 votes out of millions, of more or less 6 million votes cast in past elections. So this should be a repeat, according to them, a close one to the end. 
it comes down to this. Do you want somebody to go to D.C. and just talk? That's what Bill Nelson does. Do you want somebody goes and does something? I'll show up and I'll work. I'll work my butt off. As voters hit the polls Tuesday, Rick Scott made his final case about why he should be the best choice for Florida's Senate seat. Bill Nelson, uh, he doesn't want to work. You know, he's been there for 42 years. He can't name anything he's ever done. Scott stopped in to thank volunteers today in Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, and Pensacola, areas that have traditionally supported him. He's hoping his eight years as Florida's governor will give him the edge needed to turn what has been a blue seat for 17 years. One thing you learn in business and one thing you learn in life is that the people that show up and work hard generally get ahead. And so that's what I've done. I've worked, I've shown up and I've, I've tried to work hard at this job. The governor pledging that if he gets the opportunity to take on Washington, he'll fight for Florida. I'm going to go to D.C. and I'm going to remember where I came from. I'm going to remember I came from a mom uh, with, uh, with five kids that struggled and I'm going to try to do that and help those families. Also, I'm going to remember my business career i trying how do you build a business because that's what people want. All of our families want to work. I don't mean people don't want to work. So the most important thing you can do is get them a job. Now, Scott has, at least the pundits have said, that uh, Scott's probabilities all lie with his ties to President Trump. Whether there's a blue wave here in Florida, we'll have to see how that turns out. Scott maintains he doesn't see the blue wave happening here. Either way, he's expected to take that podium sometime tonight. Hopefully, and at least he's looking to say that he is going from Tallahassee to Washington, D.C. From Naples, David Sutter, CBS 4 News. All right, David, thank you very much. Joining us now in the studio is CBS 4's Jim DeFeedy. So, Jim, let's talk about voter turnout. It's been impressive from the start of even early voting here in Florida. Yeah, so uh, to give you an idea, this is probably going to set a record for a midterm election in the last 25 years. If you look, let's go to the first graphic that shows overall voter turnout. I mean, these numbers are just staggering. You're talking about 2,089,000 Republicans, 2,112,000 Democrats, 973,000 MPA, MPAs. Just look at that number, though, for a second and realize that out of the more than 4 million votes cast based on party, only 20 25,000 votes separate the two. That's just, that tells you how split down the middle this state is. Now, obviously, not all Republicans vote for the Republican candidates and not all Democrats vote for the Democratic candidate, but that gives you a sense for how close it is. We're also seeing good turnout today in Dade and Broward for elections. I think we're on pace to hit about 58% total turnout, which would be a really impressive number. And, Jim, you want to focus on one of the local races in Miami-Dade, Carlos yeah. Corbello and Debbie mercosel Powell. Let's, let's look at this because I want to show you just how close things are in one specific race. So here in the Congressional District 26, Democrats have uh, voted 61,798. This is going into Election Day. Republicans 60,464, which means the Democrats have an advantage of about 1,334 votes going into Election Day. Now the NPAs, the no party affiliates, 39,000 votes there. You don't know how they break. Do, are they breaking more for Republicans or are they going to break more for Democrats? Now, in years past, Carlos Cabell has done well with independence and Election Day voting. I think this race, to be honest with you, I think we go into Election Day essentially tied. And I think that the turnout on Election Day, one more hour to go, how people vote today is probably going to decide that race. Okay, the polls close at 7 o'clock and we have a one-hour newscast from 7 to 8. We're going to be getting results during that time, right, Jim? We should be ha having, really getting the first batch of results by about 7.15. And just, I will say one other thing. If you're in line at 7 p.m., yes. you still get to vote, even if it's a long line. But if you've got to be in line by 7 p.m. Okay, worth repeating. Thank you, Jim. And still ahead at 6, we're going to take a closer look at those often confusing amendments on the ballot. Plus, the clock is ticking. As Elliot just mentioned, you have less than an hour left to vote. We will check in live at polling sites in Miami-Dade and Broward. And I'm Jim Barry, live in Coral Gables. Soccer legend David Beckham hopes to score a big win tonight, but will Miami voters approve his plan to turn a public golf course into a soccer stadium complex? We'll have more on that coming up. In the meantime, CBS4 News continues right after this.
CBS 4 News continuing coverage of campaign 2018. There they are, South Florida voters casting their ballots on this election day. And imagine how much longer those lines would be if not for the fact that so many people turned out for early voting, whether it was in person or mail-in voting. More than 5.2 million Floridians voted before today. With just about 45 minutes until the polls close, let's see how the lines are right now. CBS 4's Lisa Petrillo is live at a polling location in Doral. But let's begin with CBS 4's Dave Warren live at the Coral Ridge Mall in Fort Lauderdale. Hey, Dave. Yes, hey, talk about those early numbers. Uh, 300,000 early voting in Broward County, uh, close to 170,000 mail-in votes, and 130,000 mid-afternoon in person today. That's close to 600,000 so far. Now, the line's been pretty steady here at Coral Ridge Mall. That's one place we've looked at, but we checked out the entire county. Here's what we found. I always like actually going in on election day um, just to kind of be there with all the people and just kind of like the energy. That energy is high after record early voting for those that chose to wait till election day. Now, aside from a short wait at Coral Ridge Mall, things went pretty well here, uh, provided this was your polling location. Long precinct. That same can't be said for a location in Deerfield Beach. A polling location was located inside a gated community. The problem, other precincts that vote there were outside of that. I have totally addressed this many, many times since the primaries when I was the clerk here in August, and nobody's done anything about it yet. Everybody's got to show ID? Yes, sir. To enter, an independent security company asked for ID. A few declined and were delayed, but eventually allowed to vote. But that delay backed traffic up all the way out to the main road. Now, according to Brenda Snipes, nobody was prevented from voting at that location. Overall, it seemed that things were running smoothly for those that waited until Election Day to vote exercising their right to have a voice. No right is stronger than this particular right to vote. I'm very proud to be American and very proud to vote. And for a few today, that reminds them of the sacrifices made for that right. I lost a lot of friends over there. <laughs> if you don't vote, what's it all about? Yeah, a lot of emotion here as they uh, went out of the uh, polling places. That was reported in conjunction with Probe Oblicus Election Project that monitors uh, voting conditions there uh, across the country. So line's been pretty steady. Uh, there hasn't been a rush here after work, but it has never been uh, empty uh, there. So people continue to come in uh, with uh, just about 45 minutes left. Back to you. All right, Dave, thank you very much. And our team covered shifts now to Miami-Dade County and CBS 4's Lisa Petrillo. Lisa is live at a polling site set up at a Miami-Dade fire rescue station in Doral. How's it turn out there, Lisa? It's dwindling in slowly, and as of 4 p.m., Elliot, in Dade County, roughly 164,000 votes were cast here, according to Dade elections, and so far, it's been pretty smooth. Everybody needs to vote. That's your, not only your right, but is expected for you as a citizen. Election Day bringing out voters from the melting pot that is America. How important is it for you to vote here in, the, in America? I have been voted all the time. Uh, I, I became citizen in 2008. Since then, I've been voting. I tend to, you know, uh, raise your voice and then say your opinion. Uh, hopefully it counts. <laughs> so that's all, you know. So hopefully it makes difference. I thank you, the military men, that, you know, they do what they do, they sacrifice for us to do this. Aside from the highly charged governor and senator races, plus the local races, voters are dealing with 12 Florida constitutional amendments. Were you pre-prepared? Did you know about the amendments, what you wanted to do? I did a little research before, but I probably could have done a lot more. But I, I knew a lot about the ones, the amendments I thought were important. Here at FIU South Campus, Next Gen America, the largest youth vote mobilization campaign in the country, they were here to bus students from the school to the precincts and back. Do you see, though, in your generation of kids maybe being complacent about voting, not getting out there and doing it, or are you seeing a change? I see there's a change. I believe that a lot of people know that this is a very important election and that, you know, more people are get, uh, trying to vote and being a, a part of our democracy. So, Over at the University of Miami, kids were excited to be a part of the process. All the rallies leading up to this was a very good and got the word out and let people know, hey, if you don't vote, you can't really say much. All right, so those are the last minute voters here with 20 minutes, uh, about 40 minutes left. Seven o'clock, it's all cut off. Back to you in the studio.
Thank you, Lisa. City of Miami voters are deciding today whether David Beckham's soccer group should be allowed to build a stadium, hotel, office complex, and park on city-owned Melrose County Club property. Yeah, big issue in the city of Miami. David Beckham is in South Florida and spoke earlier today. CBS4 sports anchor Jim Barry is live for us in Coral Gables with details. Jim? Well, guys, we are live tonight at Douglas Plaza where David Beckham and company are planning to hold a big victory rally tonight. Look at this setup. Very impressive indeed. Beckham's MLS team, Inter Miami FC, plans to begin playing in a couple of years. Tonight, Miami voters could actually decide where. Five and a half years ago, soccer superstar David Beckham swooped in and made South Florida swoon with the promise of bringing Major League Soccer to our doorstep. Now, Beckham and his group hope to take a victory lap. It's been a long journey, um, but obviously, you know, we're very proud of what we're presenting and excited to, uh, to hear the result. Beckham and local billionaire Jorge Mas today make some final rounds around the city, hoping voters sign off on their plan to turn Mellory's golf course into Miami Freedom Park, a giant mix of commercial property and public park space anchored by a 25,000-seat soccer stadium. We have a chance to make a difference with this project, to bring high-paying jobs, to say yes to hundreds of millions of dollars in investment, to say yes to 23 acres of soccer fields for our kids. For Beckham, this has been a political roller coaster. His initial plan of building a stadium in Overtown died on the vine. The star athlete found that this arena was much tougher than what he was used to. None of those compared to this, to be honest. It's been, uh, it's been like we said, it's been a long journey, but I know that obviously, you know, in business or in life, you know, sometimes uh, the best things are worth the wait and the best things actually take the hardest time and the longest time to actually achieve. All right, a thumbs up gives Beckham the green light to negotiate a long-term deal with the city, a long-term lease. If it's thumbs down, well, things really get interesting because his partner, Jorge Mas, says there is no plan B. We're live on Coral Gables. I'm Jim Barry, CBS4 Sports. All right, Jim, thanks a lot. We'll see how that plays out. And it looks pretty nice out there in Coral Gables tonight. Looks like tonight. a fun party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thumbs up on the weather, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Two thumbs up. Oh, okay. Well, that's extra <laughs> special. Let's show you what's going on this evening. First off, our Keys camera from Key West. Looking off to the west, catching the sunset twilight sky there on a beautiful South Florida. Evening 80 in Miami, 81 Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood. 83 in Key West, 6 on the stick in the scale. That's not really a thumbs up, is it? Have some uh, higher than normal humidity here, making it feel like 84. East, southeast breeze at 10. Here's the radar, and it's showing some showers coming off of Andros and over towards uh, Bimini. All that activity moving our way. So as we get through the night tonight, we're going to see a little bit a better chance for some showers passing by. So spotty showers moving in later on. Warm and humid, low near 76 tomorrow. Warm sun, a few showers. High temperature near 86 degrees. For boaters, no problems on the water. A gentle east breeze, averaging about 10 knots. Seas running two feet or less. A light chop on the bays. Through the rest of the week, a little better rain chance, especially on Thursday, and a mix of sun and showers over a warm and humid weekend. Back to you. Thank you, Craig. Still ahead, why is your ballot so long? The 12 amendments being decided today are at least part of the reason. CBS 4's Diane Magnum, who has covered a few elections in South Florida, takes a closer look next. Diane's Mike, there are a dozen amendments to the state constitution, blah, blah.
Welcome back. There are a dozen amendments to the state constitution on the ballot. Now, some are more confusing than others. Some are more controversial. CBS 4's Diane Magnum is here with a closer look. Diane. And guys, the confusion about these amendments stems from the fact that some of them are bundled together under one item, meaning a vote for one part of an amendment is a vote for all parts of that amendment. Amendment 6 is one of those bundled amendment issues, along with calling for a state bill of rights for all crime victims. My dad was gunned down at his home at the age of 38. Six years later, my sister Karen was brutally raped and murdered. She was 18. It also mandates raising the mandatory retirement age of judges from 70 to 75. Here comes Woody! Amendment 13, if approved, would end commercial dog racing involving wagering here in Florida, a practice critics maintain is inhumane. But the Florida Greyhound Association disputes those claims and has lobbied hard against this amendment. Amendment 3 is another ballot issue dealing with gambling here in Florida. If approved, it would would take out of the hands of lawmakers and give to voters the power to approve or reject any new gambling licenses going forward. And while the ads have purported this is an issue of voters' rights, Amendment 3 restores control of gambling to voters, not politicians. Opponents to the amendment maintain this is simply an effort by the Seminole Indian Tribe and the Disney Corporation to hold on to Florida as their exclusive gambling domain. And as we keep an eye on the returns tonight, remember that all amendments to the Florida Constitution must win a super majority to pass. That means the magic number for approval is 60% of the vote. Back to you. Diane, thank you. And if you haven't voted yet, you must go to your designated polling site tonight. If you are in line by 7 o'clock, you will be allowed to vote. If you have an absentee ballot, you need to either drop it off at election headquarters by 7 or have it canceled at a polling site. For more, head to cbsmiami.com slash election guide. CBS 4 News has you covered tonight. CBS 4 News at 6 is followed by the CBS Evening News at 6.30. And then join us for a special one-hour edition of CBS 4 News at 7. CBS News coverage goes from 8 until 11. And we'll have local election updates all night long and wrap up the day right here at 11. And CBS 4 News at 6 will be right back.
That's our news for now. The CBS Evening News with Jeff Flores next. And we're back with a special one-hour election edition of CBS 4 News at 7. The polls close in 30 minutes. You have half an hour. If you're in line by 7, you can vote. We'll see you in half an hour at 7.